Hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the start of session three. Uh, this is a session on video streaming, and we have uh, three very exciting papers uh, to be presented. Uh, and the first uh, paper uh, will be presented by Sina Kesavadi. Um, Sina, if you're on, uh, please indicate that. Sina is a PhD student at University of Calgary, and this is a paper co-authored with his um, advisor, Kerry Williamson. Sina Kesavadi, I want to present the paper, An Empirical Measurement Study of Free Lives TV services. The co-author is Kerry Williamson. Free live streaming services provide unauthorized broadcasting of live events. Using these services raise concern about the performance, quality of experience, and user privacy. The ecosystem of these uh, services include media providers provide and stream the media content, the channel provider receive live streaming from media provider and sell them to the users, the aggregators that provide a list of available streams, we have users and we have the advertisers. The question we had in, for this research was, what are the network and video QoS? Are these services scalable? And what the privacy risks are associated with these services? We use the movie for capturing the um, video streaming. We also use a Google Chrome browser for video streaming and chart proxy for decreasing the connections. Data collection, we use the Reddit uh, that is so common in the North America. Um, the user, they share the live streaming services there. So we selected the type five most popular according to user votes in um, four different sports, the NHL hockey games, NBA basketball game, NFL, the football games, and U5 soccer games. And also, we compare these 20 free providers with two Canadian legitimate providers, the TSNR, that we collected data from the December 2019 to the March of the 2020. From Network QoS, we observed that most of the free websites, free providers, they use HTTP. So we have the one of them using the HTTPS, but mainly they are using the HTTP. The protocol used by free providers was mainly using the TCP. Also, we observed with some of the UDP, but most of them use the TCP. The legitimate providers, they use the UDP, and one of them use the quick protocol. The legitimate provider provides a really high throughput and low delay loss in our, net, uh, our lab network in the campus. The delay was really high in the soccer game, and we use the geolocation tools, and we observed they are using, they are streaming from the Europe. The NHL game, they are uh, so popular in Canada that we are resident, and there was really low delay and loss and good throughput from these providers. And we observed that they are using the CDN, the content delivery network, to deliver the data. The video quality of the service, we have there even with the legitimate provider, we have about 10 to 12 second broadcasting delay, delay, the time that the real game is playing when we watching them. So that was really high in the second game, uh, one or two minutes in the other providers, but in the NHL was about the 3, uh, 32, 35, Second, that was really impressive, impressive because they need to record the uh, video and then broadcast them. That impressive. The start type time, the time we play the button, play button, and it start to play was really low in the legitimate provider, and also that was low in the natural provider, but that was high in the popular events. We observe with. Um, Quality switch, rebuffering, and resolution very common frequently in the free live streaming services. One of them, without uh, this rebuffering and quality switch, but the quality at the first was really low. That was really um, so 
satisfied, satisfying in the using the legitimate providers. They are not as scalable, the free library stream services, and the NBA final, the popular game, none of them was um, able to serve the service. The privacy view, so we observed that this website, they are, um, they are setting the tracking app, and we use an um, ad blocker list of the website, and we check to see which one is the malicious ad. None of them was malicious ad in the legitimate provider, but that was very common in the free providers. Some of these free providers, if you install the ad blocker, they don't serve the, um, they don't serve the service to you. And they, that is becoming um, more popular. Doesn't ask for setting the cookies, but TSN doesn't ask for um, setting cookie. Some of the free providers are also asking permission to set the cookies from a user. And also we had the third party cookies that were very common. Some of these third party cookies was uh, worth um, tracker. That was very high in the TSN and the legitimate providers. We observed that free licensing services send the public and private IP addresses to the server. The, they have access to the name of the ISP. We are using the CTA and area. We are locating the device name, OS, and browser version, the graphical model, and the proxy information. They, are, they know that we are using the proxy or not. The app locker tools doesn't um, prevent this data transmission. In conclusion, we are with the line broadcasting delay in the free live stream services, the throughput, all the switch, um, streaming quality, the packet loss, everything was directly different between the free live stream services. Uh, TSN used a quick and that improved the performance in the Wi Fi network with high delay or There is uncertainly streaming um, popular even by using the free live streaming services, and there are some privacy and security risks with free live streaming. The data set um, address, the movie tool, the chart for C address, they are here. And this is my email address for more content. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Okay, thank you, Nishan. Um, I'm here for to answering the questions. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that great talk. Um, so, questions. Well, I look for questions on the uh, Slack channel uh, or here on the Q and A channel. Uh, please just post it. Uh, and just as a reminder, as I posted on the Slack channel, there will the, the session is being recorded. So, if you if you want to talk, that's fine. You can indicate that as well. But just remember that you will be recorded. Um, that you're fine with that. So I see a question here uh, from Lars Prem. Um, and the question is, how closely uh, did you monitor the network condition of your vantage point? Might it be that, for example, quality changes are biased by the network load on the last mile? And uh, if the host could please unmute Lars in case uh, he has a follow-up to this. Yeah, that is the question about the network conditions so we use our university lab and one of the questions we had is uh, at the first about the because we have different network condition in different time of the day so the games we recorded mostly were uh, at the evening and we use the wi-fi the university is a good con uh, is a good wi-fi condition so we try to record the video from the same game um this different provider in the same games at the same time and mostly they were at the evening uh that the, our um, campus and our department was uh, a few people there so we try to be fair and be in a good condition and this all the provider in the same condition and we uh we experiment for our re result in the paper is three time is average of the three time of the um, experiment. So we try to be fair in this way. Great. Thank you. Lars is typing a follow-up question. No, okay, just says thanks. 
Um, all right, so I had a I had a kind of a question about regarding the privacy aspects. Do you see that there is more privacy leakage in these streaming services than uh, compared to regular websites, for example, or do you, did you make that comparison at all? So the first thing we should consider what the data actually we can receive from the web browser because the web browser has a limited access and they um, they use some um, boxes um, to prevent the data leak so i think the this free website they try to get everything they had access to mm -hmm. but they are different from mobile application because mobile application has different access so this free website they are limited to the web browser to the similar uh, website, the export video streaming legitimate providers. So we check them and they not um, send all information, but they have access to your um, IP address and some information. But for example, I haven't seen the my um, public IP address. I just saw my private IP address or the other information is common for them, actually. Interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to compare whether you know, whether there is more or less privacy leakage compared to things like you know Flash, for example, which is being. Um... Yeah, the the main concern is about the cookies and the tracking that they have in in the code beside uh, behind the web page. So they have some uh, tracking ad behind the page that um, follow you when you are browsing the um, different pages and they for example some of them uh, we clear the cookies and everything and we observe it for example some of them they set 120 cookies on your web browser uh, so that is the thing uh, the main concern about the privacy indeed yeah any other questions from anyone we have a couple of minutes if there are questions All right, if there are no more questions, then I would say we can move on to uh, the second speaker, uh, which we believe would be Ishani Sarkar uh, from Easy Broadcast Nantes uh, in France. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and thank you, Nashan, and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Sina. It was a great talk. Ishani, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Ishani. Uh, I am doing my thesis with the University of Nice and also with Easy Broadcast. Um, I am I am presenting this paper. I have done this paper with my uh, with my thesis director, Guillaume Urvaikuler, with my boss in the enterprise, Sufyan Hubia, and one another professor in the university, Dinu Sir. Hello everyone, my name is Ishani Sarkar. I'm here to present my paper on data-driven data analysis and tuning of a live hybrid CDN V2V video distribution system. Uh, the one of the, uh, the typical architecture of the live video streaming uses either dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP or HTTP live streaming protocol. For both the protocol, the stream is divided into smaller chunks. The clients first download the manifest file, uh, which has information about the small chunks, and then these smaller chunks are downloaded. One of the important challenges of live streaming is that it needs to be fairly synchronized with the lifetime. Also, the basic client server architecture, where every request for each uh, chunk is to say, is sent to the CDN induces high bandwidth cost for the content provider. At Easy Broadcast, we use a bar TC, which provides a clientless solution and allow browsers, different browsers to communicate between each other without any third party um, software we, and allows them to exchange video, video chunks. We call this uh, V2V exchanges. It eludes the traffic from the CDN. At Easy Broadcast, we operate over 300 worldwide video video and radio channels and have almost 27 million unique viewers. Uh, in this slide, I would like to present two of the important components of the Easy Broadcast architecture. The first um, important component is the video player, another is the Easy Broadcast library. So as you can see, as the viewer starts the player, the player loads the Easy Broadcast library. Uh, it's the player who decides the playing quality of the stream, and it's the Easy Broadcast library who decides whether the chunk will be downloaded from the CDN or from another viewer. Uh, 
to explain a bit more in detail about the junk download process, as you already know, the player loads the Easy Broadcast Library. The Easy Broadcast Library then queries the manager for other viewers who are watching the same content are in, and are in the same quality level. Viewers then connect with each other to form a swarm. Viewers uh, download the video. First download tries to download the video from the swarm. And after TO seconds, it goes to the CDN. TO second depends on the chunk size of the stream. For example, if the chunk size is six seconds, the, we give five seconds to download in the V2V mode. <clears throat> Uh, some of the, the challenges that we have tried to tackle in this paper is to increase the V2V efficiency uh, we, we, and also decrease the unsuccessful V2V chunks. Chunks which are sent but are not received before the timeout leads to unnecessary traffic in the V2V environment. In this paper, we have profiled a typical video channel. We then identify the bat line that should be uploading the chunks to the viewers and then decide device and algorithm to allow the clients to identify the viewers as bad. We have have done the experiments in both control and the wild. One of the main constraints while, up do, while creating this algorithm is to maintain the quality of experience for the viewers. We now, uh, in the next section, we do a channel profiling, we discuss the data set, and we also do some client profiling as well. Uh, we have aggregated over three days of data with, with over 34,000 unique clients and almost 6.2 terabytes of data was downloaded. The analyzed channel is an entertainment channel along with some important even, sports even broadcasted over time. Uh, we collect various information in our data set, but the most important information that we collect is the exchange between viewers and viewers and viewers and CDN. Uh, we started our client profiling and we saw that almost 1% of the viewers are doing 90% of the bytes exchange in V2V mode. We correlated this with watching time. So for, uh, for over, overall viewers, um, the mean uh, watching time is almost six seconds, whereas our top 1% viewers, the mean watching time is two minutes. Another factor that is likely to heavily affect the viewer's ability to perform effective V2V exchanges is its network access characteristics. As part of the content is downloaded from the CDN servers, which is likely to be close to the client and feature good network performance, the average throughput achieved during chunks download from the CDN provides a good hint on the network access capacity of the users. As we can see from figure one, there is a significant difference between the CDN bitrates of the overall viewers and the and the most active top 1% viewers, which experience way higher throughput. The correlation coefficient between CDN bitrate and um, the chunk loss rate for overall viewers is minus 0.47, whereas for the most active top 1% viewers, it is minus 0.7. Ideally, when we do expect these values to be negative, as better the access link of the user is, less likely it is to miss the deadline while sending or receiving a chunk. For this perspective, the CLR is highly correlated with the CDN performance and it does is a good metrics to uh, uh, and this it is a good estimator for the reception uh, quality of the viewers the actual chunk loss rate are uh, of the overall viewers and the active viewers are represented in figure two as we can see for the top one percent viewers the graph is left skewed uh, oh, uh, almost 20 percent of the almost 50 percent of the clients experience less than 20% loss chunk rate, whereas all the others will experience uh, uniformly between 20% and 75% loss chunk rate. Uh, we further move forward and we divided the uh, one per top 1% 1 viewers into good viewers and bad viewers. The good viewers, uh, um, we, we, we did this just to isolate uh, some of the important causes behind high chunk loss rate. Now we would now do the detailed analysis and test different hypotheses behind uh, uh, behind high chunk loss rate. The first hypothesis states that the neighbor set size of the viewer should affect the chunk loss rate. But from our, uh, from our analysis, we did not find any significant correlation between the CLR and the song size. The next hypothesis was the type of device play a role in the chunk loss rate. We again did not find any significant correlation between the type of device and CLR. We have further discussed both the hypothesis and detail in the paper. I would like to now focus uh, on the one of on the last and the most important hypothesis. The last hypothesis is the network uplink and downlink throughput affects the loss chunk rate. 
As you can see from figure five, figure five and figure six, good viewers have good CDN and V to V throughput, whereas bad viewers have reasonable CDN and poor V to V throughput. Hence, hence, the bottleneck is the uplink, uplink capacity of the users. We use this to create an uh, create an algorithm to identify bad clients. We call this algorithm a CLR mitigation algorithm. Yeah. The overall logic behind this algorithm is that the viewers estimate his chunk loss rate when sending. Uh, if it is too high, the viewers stop uploading the chunks to the other viewers, but they can still download uh, in V2V mode. They stop uh, uploading the downloaded uh, uploading the chunks for some time. There are more details for this algorithm discussed uh, in their team. The most more details about this algorithm is uh, discussed in the paper in detail. Um, we also then did the comparison of uh, the two chunks of the two of the two uh, three two three day long periods on the same channel, one with algorithm, one with without algorithm. And we see that almost 35, 37% of the good viewers do not experience any kind of loss chunk rate. Um, overall, almost uh, overall loss chunk rate also decreased from 24.7% to 13.7%. Um, we also tried to measure if there was any impact on the quality of experience for the viewers, and we do not find any quality of um, experience uh, impact on the on the system which is discussed also in more detail we have also discussed in detail the experiments done in the test bed which is present in the paper thank you very much and thank you for your time thanks ishani um now i open the floor for questions and uh, please post on slack uh, if you have any questions uh, and meanwhile, well, there are questions. Can I can I ask about the average upload uh, bandwidths? Because one of the things that uh, mm -hmm. we found in a previous study was, um, uh, so in in the UK there's BBC which has um, yes. something called iPlayer, uh, and turns out that so initially they started off with a peer assisted or P2P based upload, which they abandoned, and this was way back in 2008. Uh, but now if you look at the upload bandwidths in the UK, it's about 6.2 megabits per second, which if you look at the requirements for even Netflix HD, it's about mm -hmm. 5 megabits per second. So yes. technically, it should be possible. It should, uh, upload should not be a limitation at all for peer-to-peer, -peer, but per perhaps there's quite a lot of variation, which is why you're seeing some of these results. Um, so uh, yes, I mean there could be a lot of variations. Uh, I mean we uh, we do we did expect it that um, uh, locations uh, prove a vital point. I mean the ISPs or the locations of the viewers uh, do influence the upload and the download capacity of the viewers. Uh, so most of the clients for this channel are based on Morocco. And uh, this, uh, for, for us, at, uh, at this point, uh, they, it's one of the important points that we found uh, is the uplink capacity that, they, that, they, that is being affected. Uh, we, do, we did expect uh, some other factors like the swamp size. So we were thinking maybe uh, since a lot of, or there are like 10 viewers in the same swamp and there are a lot of control messages transferred between each other for each chunk, the, trans the information is traversed so maybe uh, this affects the upload capacity of the viewer since you are almost uh, every time uploading the information in the SOM you are downloading the information from the SOM but uh, uh, we haven't, uh, I mean, we did the uh, correlations, but uh, it's more related with the uh, with the watching time period. So even if we, if you look in the paper, uh, there are good viewers uh, who have uh, more uh, more participants in the swarm over time. But then we correlated uh, this information with the watching time of the good viewers and bad viewers, and we saw that okay, bad viewers stay for like. Uh, 20, 20, 12 minutes uh, on an average, whereas uh, good viewers stay more than uh, 20 minutes on an average. So 
for us, it was because we wanted to improve the V2V efficiency. We also wanted to re reduce the unwanted chunks in the P2P network. So for us, we uh, we came to a conclusion that the developing, if the upload uh, link is the blockage here, we could uh, develop an algorithm, identify the clients who are uh, who are unable to. Uh, upload successfully and stop the upload uh, for for our stream actually uh, because it's not us who encodes really the um, the um, capacity or the encoding capacity of the different quality levels so for our stream it's um, like uh, 10.2 megabits per second of uh, the highest quality streamed, whereas the middle quality, as we say, is uh, almost 7.2 megabits per second. So it could also be one of the factors that there are, it, it is a, a bit difficult for the clients to download uh, chunks or upload chunks. Interesting, thanks. Let me just see if there are any other questions in the video streaming session. Please post your questions if you have any um, either here or in the um, in the Slack channel. Um, so I, I guess one other kind of follow-up question uh, is, have you compared to the architecture of uh, other such um, PL-assisted CDMs such as? Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so we did not find any previous like very recent studies which uh, were comparing why there were like uh, what the estimations in the P two P networks. Uh, is there a, is there any um, algorithms to increase more efficiency? Of course, there are some algorithms which uh, uh, which talk about improving the peer to peer efficiency, but those are mainly based while choosing your your swamp. Uh, mm -hmm. not what's happening in really inside the swamp. So uh, our paper was based on what is really happening inside the swamp. And we did not find any specific uh, paper related to, to, this, um, uh, to this hybrid uh, P2P CDN technology. There are some papers based on pure P2P, but uh, those are just measurements uh, based on pure P2P environment. Okay, there's there's some previous literature on you know, things like uh, Akamai net session in IMC mm -hmm. five six years back. Uh, I think probably IMC twenty thirteen probably so now six seven years back. There's also a question on the Slack channel from Bala on uh, if you could brief, briefly comment on how you measured uh, yeah. experience. Yeah, so we we uh, for each chunk we have the quality of the chunks that uh, that were downloaded for each player, and we compared uh, for three days for the two algorithms if the percentage of the quality of chunks downloaded in each quality uh, varied over with algorithm and without algorithm. So with with this we said okay since we did not see any huge variations between the quality of chunks uh, downloaded uh, in each quality percentages of chunks uh, we we decided that okay our algorithm does not uh, really affect the quality of experience for the viewers okay thanks i see there's one more question being typed okay yes it's true i come my paper is not about live video that's true yeah <clears throat> All right, so uh, if there are no other questions, um, then we can move on to the third and final uh, paper of this session, which will be from uh, Vivek Adarsh, who is a fourth year PhD candidate at uh, UCSB. Vivek, over to you. Hi, Nishan, and welcome for to the third presentation of the video streaming session. My name is Vivek, and today I'll talk about our study too late for playback, where we estimate video stream quality in rural and urban contexts. With COVID-19 pandemic, the assessment of quality of experience, or QOE, for applications delivered over mobile broadband has become urgent as work from home and online schooling protocols increase the demand for video streaming applications. Consequently, communities without access to usable high-speed broadband, such as many rural communities, are particularly disadvantaged. More than 60 million people reside in rural regions in the US. Cellular deployment, however, is often guided by economic demand, concentrating deployment in urban areas and leaving 
economically marginalized and sparsely populated areas underserved. And we've seen that there is a lack of accessible measurement data sets that are not only comprehensive, but also representative and inclusive of rural demographics. However, evaluating video stream quality in rural areas presents severe scalability challenges. For one, gathering QoE measurements are time and resource intensive for each network provider. Now let's take a closer look at the scalability challenge. In any mobile or war driving style campaign, such as ours, QoE measurements typically need applications to run for a minimum duration to aggregate adequate data points for analysis. Quality of service or QoS measurements, however, take considerably less time and resources to gather. For instance, the graph shown on the top right depicts two different experiments being run on the same mobile device at different times. First, we collect the target QoS metrics. In this case, it's RSRP and throughput. We'll talk about it in a bit. And in the second experiment, we collect QoE measurements from YouTube. For all the three plots shown here, that is CPU load, memory utilization, and system temperature, QoS measurements incur significantly less resources than QoE measurements, which is why through this study, we explore a methodology that uses QoS measurements to accurately predict QoE. In addition, the QoS measurements can be readily acquired without the use of complex systems. Now we formulate the research question as follows. Can we infer the quality of experience for video streaming applications over LTE networks at scale? And if so, how? To do so, we undertook an extensive measurement campaign to collect 16 data sets comprising of network traces from southwestern US for four major telecom operators, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon. Our data sets vary along two primary axes, population density and network load. To obtain data from varied population densities, we collected network measurements within multiple rural and urban communities. Of variable network load, we collected traces from crowded events in urban locations that resulted in atypical high volumes of network utilization and as a result, congestion. We also collected traces from the same urban locations during typical operating conditions as a baseline. Overall, our data set contains over 32 million LTE packets. For this study, we collect two QoS metrics synchronously, RSRP and throughput. RSRP, or reference signal received power, is the linear average over the power contributions of the resource elements of the reference signals within the frequency bandwidth. For throughput, we fetch a 500 megabyte file from a cloud instance. In addition, we collect video resolution, resolution switching, and rebuffing events while streaming YouTube videos. Next, we set out to model the network performance in order to infer two target metrics, rebuffing events and resolution switching. The models were fed synchronous RSRP and throughput values as input features. After varying the resolution of past samples for the input features, we found that using a sequence of three throughput and RSRP values enabled us to strike a balance between model complexity and accuracy. We thoroughly evaluated this for 15 models, including a mix of simpler and complex algorithms. Results are shown in the plots at the bottom. X-axis represents the locations, and Y-axis shows the magnitude for accuracy, precision, and recall. Our investigation reveals that Simpler ensemble learning methods such as boosting and random forest perform comparably well with larger, complex architectures such as recurrent, recurrent neural networks. With at least 85% precision and recall in inferring rebuffing events, and about 80% precision and recall when it comes to predicting resolution switching. When RNNs have marginally higher accuracies, the training times are magnitudes higher than simpler models such as boosting. Consequently, 
we select boosting as our optimal model for QA prediction. Next, we wanted to examine the scalability of our models for different video genres. To evaluate that, we collect over 108 video sessions from seven different video genres on YouTube. These videos were chosen based on the top trending charts on the day of testing. We collect this in our research facility here at UCSB. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the plot shown on the bottom right. X-axis represents various video genres, while Y-axis shows the accuracy, precision, and recall values. When we deploy a boosting model over these video sessions, we were able to validate the generalizability of the model with about 1.5% deviation from our previous results in the case of rebuffering events and less than 3% difference in resolution switching. Finally, for analyzing the feature importance of our input metrics, we undertake an ablation study where we measure the performance of boosting using just throughput values and then with a combination of RSRP and throughput values. The figure on the top right shows the result of this ablation study. We note that the median accuracy gain is about 10% with a maximum gain difference of over 18% in certain cases. The ablation study is useful to learn about the contribution of each input features. And with that, I'd like to conclude this presentation. I'd now like to take any questions, comments, or suggestions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Vivek. Um, I see there's already one question uh, in the Slack channel. Um, and Shubho Sen asks, any thoughts on why there were such high bit rates for the encoding? You said medium quality was around seven megabits per second. What was the resolution of this track? This is in reference to a specific slide where you're probably talking about uh, the quality. Um, I'm not sure if this question was directed to me. Is could you clarify? Because um, I'm not sure this is relevant to the study. Shubha, would you like to? Unmute? Can someone unmute Shubha so that the question can be asked? Or if Shubo could just type uh, in the Slack channel, then I can ask the question as well. Okay, while well, we are waiting for that, or maybe there's a confusion, it might have been directed towards the previous paper as well. Um, yeah, so Ishani is saying yes, it, yeah, it, it does sound like it was towards the previous one. So uh, while others are typing questions for this uh, talk, I, I had a question about your choice of the most popular videos and uh, whether that means, you know, the it gets cached somewhere which might impact on the QoE experience and so forth, right? So were you trying to establish a lower bound on QOE uh, by looking at these popular videos, what was the intention of that and how did that affect your study? Right, so the intention for um, you know choosing so many different video genres was to validate uh, what results we found from my initial study, right? So in the initial study, we had just one video and that's kind of like the trade-off you have with the war driving style campaign. We cannot really have multiple streams going on because it would take a lot more time, which is exactly the opposite of the point we're trying to make in the paper, right? So there was only one video uh, in the original study, but the models that we um, essentially established using those data points, we wanted to scale it to other video genres. So on the day of, so after the, these uh, various video genres were collected at our research facility here at UCSB. And then what we did was that we figured out what was the top trending videos nationally in the US for different genres, for example, for sports or uh, news broadcasts or music videos, for instance. Uh, and then we found the top 10 or something of that sort um, videos. Uh, we ran them for 10 minutes long, each collected the data points and used the same model to figure out 
how much, um, you know, how, how well the models performed on those new set of sample sets. And turns out uh, we had a deviation of less than one and a half percent from the original video, which sort of uh, indicates that the model is well suited to be used elsewhere as well, in, in the video genres at least that we used. Sure. Did you think this will work even for long form videos? Uh, so like a full Netflix uh, video stream or something where there might be more, slightly more variation? Right. So this study was directed only at YouTube videos. Um, so we cannot claim that this works on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime or anything of that sort. Uh, but we do intend to have a similar study uh, incorporating all these various uh, pla streaming platforms as well and developing models. OK, thanks. Any other questions from anyone? Going once, twice. If not, I think we have, uh, we're going to finish five minutes early. Um, yeah, those were three very interesting talks. Thank you very much uh, for those talks. And uh, if you think of other questions after this, um, you can put post them in the channel, which is the advantage of having the Slack channel in the first place. And I'm sure the authors will be able to answer during the conference. Thanks everyone for the nice talks. <clears throat> Take care. So we have, I think, about 15 minutes, well, now nearly 20 minutes until the next session.